Sean, after watching the film, how did you assess what happened in the final seven minutes on Saturday? Well, um, you know, certainly didn't handle that portion of the game well. That's obvious. Um, you know, I'm, I think number one, you know, focusing on the first uh, 36 minutes, you know, I thought we played some really, really good basketball against an excellent team, a team that's talented, you know, in, a, in what I would say really not a true neutral venue. I think probably more of pro Texas A&M and uh, really proud of our guys and the team for being able to go into that type of environment against that type of, of quality of an opponent and I think play the way, the way we did for 36 minutes. You know, the last four minutes, you know, is a function of a number of things, uh, one of which is when you're, when you're playing the amount of players that we're playing, uh, you don't always finish the game as strong as you really want to. Uh, number two, on missed free throws, uh, we would have been better off from a mathematical perspective if they would have made every free throw because uh, on the missed free throw, they not only got three missed free throws, but they converted those three missed free throws into seven points. So in, in some cases, it was make one, miss the second, and then score two or score three. You know, that has a way of not working to your advantage. So, you know, looking at that, uh, we broke down and, you know, everybody blames the biggest guy on the court. Clearly, if, if you're a four or a five in that situation, you want to hold your ground and be able to get the ball. But the way we block out on a free throw, uh, we have four people trying to block out two, and the fifth player blocks out the shooter. Uh, we, we broke down in that four on two block out. Uh, we had a, a couple freshmen that we've been talking to about the importance of, of doing that. And when they didn't, a team that's hungry, talented, ball bounces the right way. So that's number one. Uh, I think just if, if you rebound missed free throws, um, the game's probably over. Uh, number two, um, the poise against the pressure. Uh, poise in the half court had a couple unforced turnovers that uh, you don't oftentimes see. Um, again, you have a lot of different guys in different roles. They're not as comfortable in that setting. If you go through the 11 games we've already played, uh, you can count you know once or twice where there's been something close to that. So it was like the first time that you're in that situation and uh, we look like it. So I'm glad we have the opportunity to learn from it. I think a lot of our problems at the end of the game are very fixable. Uh, some of it is going to happen when Parker returns. Uh, so uh, I think for us, uh, watching the film, being able to practice so that when that situation uh, approaches again, that we're going to be that much more sure and organized uh, in and of ourselves. The other thing is we're not 20 points better than Texas A&M. So, you know, when you're up 20, it's like, well, you guys should have won by 25. But if you beat Texas A&M in Houston by 20 or 25, you're a heck of a team. You know, I, I think that the game should have ended by probably about a 10-point spread. And uh, we certainly did a number of things that didn't allow that to happen. But uh, I haven't really been a part of a run against a, a, our team like that. 18-2, to two, I think it was. Uh, you know, that stays with you. But when I watched it on film, uh, it didn't affect me as a coach nearly as much as it did when it first happened. I think you, you watch things, it makes perfect sense. And uh, I think that when our guys have the opportunity to see it, uh, they'll be that much more equipped and better to handle it the next time around. How comfortable were you when Raleigh went to the line shooting those free throws with 15 seconds left? I, you know, I wasn't comfortable only from the perspective that so many things consecutively went against us that, it, you know, you almost say to yourself, uh, man, it, it, he's going to have the weight of the world on his shoulders to, to make it. It was like the first good thing that happened in what seemed like an eternity. But, you know, Raleigh is a very composed young guy, uh, as evidenced by how he's played in the biggest games on our schedule. And he's very sure of himself. He's very confident. He's one of a number of players that I would say in that situation we would want to be fouled. And he's a good free throw shooter as well. But those two free throws uh, were big. I think, again, you focus on the negative. There are a number of things that we have to be better at the next time around. But think about what that does for a young player like Raleigh to go uh, in that venue against Texas A&M under that pressure and make both what that will do for him moving forward. And ditto for Lowry because he got trapped without a timeout through a great pass. Uh, we drew it up to get Lowry the ball. And again, for him to be able to handle that pressure, deliver that pass to Raleigh. Those are two good big plays that two freshmen made that on a positive note, I think that will give them, and us as a team, us as a coaching staff, a lot of confidence moving forward. You're short, you know, seven guys. Does that affect your defense in terms of being aggressive? 
so you won't get into foul trouble or possibly not get into trouble? No, uh, I think the opposite's true. You just have to be really disciplined. You know, the, the number of plays that happen in a 40-minute game that a guy reaches, you know, a guy grabs a jersey on the, on the underneath out of bounds, um, a screen where you put your elbow out, those things bother our team way more than they would bother any other team or, or hopefully our team moving forward. Um, so we don't have the room for error. In terms of effort, when you play with great effort, and I'll give you Grand Canyon to be a great example, you foul less. You know, we're, we're not trying to, uh, you know, play hard and foul. Um, our, our players adjusted, like against Missouri, one of the things that I talked to you guys about was our unnecessary fouls around the rim, where you had a number of our big guys coming down on shooters, and getting there late, reaching in, and not using their, their God-given size so that the drivers have to score over them, not bailing them out. We've done that really well in the last two games. A lot of Texas A&M's inside field goals that they missed, they looked like easy shots, like, wow, they missed it. But you have to remember, I mean, there's a seven-footer here, there's a 6'10 player there. So, you know, affecting shots around the rim uh, is something that we are good at. And not fouling in doing that is, is really important. But we did that really well in both of the last two games. Obviously, they made that run, but in the first half and in some of those stretches, they didn't miss a lot of those easy shots that would have kept them in the game. And at the end, they hit those shots that kind of... Yeah, and at the end, we fouled a lot more um, because they were so aggressive. And, and let me just tell you that we won't play against a better big guy than Tyler Davis. I mean, he's... He's a preseason first team all SEC player for a reason. We knew before we played them that he's a load. Uh, you know, playing against Karnowski at Gonzaga and then playing against Tyler Davis, you know, they're two of the premier centers in the country. And the other, I think, thing about Texas A&M, you know, they have their, their freshman. He's really good, too, and he'll only get better as time moves on. So it's not like they just had one big guy in there. But I thought for the most part um, – we did a really good job. Uh, again, at the end of the game, you know, a lot of times you see at the end of the game a team makes a comeback by making threes or driving it. They made their comeback by really going at Tyler Davis. But if we handle missed free throws, if we are a little bit more poised on one or two possessions and run 20, 30 more seconds off the clock, um, and in, I'm just telling you that in our best attempt, uh, the last eight minutes of the game, you start to run out of gas. And we have to be smart. That's why, you know, the tempo is a fine line. Uh, I pulled the tempo back. And you, and you could say, well, coach, you, you know, your guys weren't as aggressive. That hurt you. But you have to be smart as well. You know, when you're up 14 points, up 16 points, under the eight-minute media timeout, and you're only playing seven players, you run a possession of 20 and 30 seconds off. If you make that shot or get fouled at the end, it's very difficult for them to mount a comeback. We didn't. Again, about everything that could go wrong in that in that brief stretch did, but um, you know I'm glad that we were able to leave with a win. It was a, it was a really good win for our team. You mentioned Parker and your open. There's a rumor he might be ahead of schedule. Is there any update you can give that? I think he is ahead of schedule. When I talked initially about potentially eight weeks, I don't believe that it's uh, in the cards for him to be out for eight. Um, what the actual time is, uh, we'll find out more and more. Um, you know, he's going to try a few things today that he hasn't. But he's uh, approaching the three-week mark. He's made the progress that we would like. You know, as, as Justin Kokoski has mentioned on high ankle sprains, you really can't predict how quickly people heal or how, you know, the improvement is going to increase um, because it's not a swelling issue. You know, you look at Parker, and it's not like one of his, his ankles or, or legs looks much different than, than the other. They look the same. It's just you lose a lot of your strength there. So, but he's been able to get that strength back. He's working hard. Uh, now that he doesn't have any academic responsibility, he has e even more time to devote. He's able to work out now five on zero. He's able to get in the gym by himself and go through a 40 minute workout. So all of those are good signs. And uh, you know, I think it's gonna point to him making an earlier comeback. I, I would give you the exact date, but I, I still don't know that right now. To open the conference season, is that even a possibility? I think it's a possibility. Um, I also think there's a possibility that that isn't the case. <laughs> it, it, yeah. it, That's what also, I'm being told, so I'm, <laughs> that, now you know how I feel. Is it also a case of you would definitely err on the side of caution with this kind of injury? Or? 
Initially, um, he's he's entering that phase of of where he's able to do certain things with full range of motion and his strength returns, that uh, he's not at risk, and that, that's that's the the first threshold that we want to get through, where he's not at further risk. You know, sometimes uh, you bring a guy back from a high ankle injury. These are very common in football, not common in basketball. What you worry about in football is the obvious that they're not always going to be able to control who tackles them or what angle they're going to be at in basketball. You know, the probability of being tackled or or in a situation is is much different. So it's a different sport that he's trying to return back to. However, there's a lot of cutting. You know, there's a lot of jumping here, which uh, it, on another end of the spectrum affects him in a negative way. So I'm trusting the doctors. I'm trusting Justin. I know that we're, A, number one, making sure that we're not going to put Parker at any further risk. But Parker's doing a really good job. And I think that uh, in some ways he's maybe ahead of schedule from the first diagnosis. It sounds like maybe if you get to that point, it's more of a pain threshold thing than, than where he could could risk re it. I mean. mm -hmm. and, and I think just like how comfortable he is stopping, starting, cutting, jumping, landing. You know, you can do it and you're not going to further injure yourself, but how, how effective are you going to be in a, in a live college basketball game? There's a big difference between being out there by yourself and being out there with nine other people. So with Parker, in retrospect, <coughs> would, would you have liked to have had two true point guards on this roster? It just seems like during your tenure here, it's been more towards combo guards, having a lot of combo guards versus having a lot of true point guards. Yes, you're right. You're right about that. Um, you know, we've we've had success at that position. I think if you just go through the research, and you know, I was reminded in Houston, Nick Wise was at the game, so I, we spent some time with Nick. But you know, I remember. Uh, it seems like 20 years ago, by the way, that he was here. Um, but he was a first team all Pac-12, at that time, Pac-10 point guard uh, in, in my first year as the coach, if you remember that. He was terrific his senior year. Uh, Mark Lyons was here for a brief time, and Mark would be that combo guy you're referring to. Uh, he, too, was a first team you know, all Pac-12 player in the one year he was with us. Everybody thinks of TJ as being different, you know, and then Parker's very similar to TJ and that he's a pass first point guard. But I think that as long as on your roster you have more than one player that can play that position, that uh, that's what we try to do. And uh, obviously, sometimes if you have just two straight pure point guards, that they almost take away from each other because it's difficult to have them on the court at the same time. But in our case, uh, you know, we've been able to play whoever plays the point guard position with the other. Uh, Nick Johnson's a great example of Nick could play the point, but he could certainly be in the game with the point. So, uh, you know, moving forward, I think like everything in recruiting, you, t you try to get the best that you can. And uh, playing with guys with more than one position, I think, is very beneficial. I mean, think about where we would be without Kadeem. You know, Kadeem plays as many as three different positions for us. Is he a pure point guard? He's not, but the fact that he's capable gives us much needed depth. And uh, in our situation, you know, he's he's been a godsend. If um, uh, hypothetically, if you get one guy, two guys back, how much this helps because everyone's playing different positions and learning more about where to be, all that stuff. How does that help down the road? <coughs> if we were able to get our whole team back. I think all of us would point towards these, you know, this stretch here of really the whole year, from the beginning of the school year until, you know, through tomorrow's game, as being incredibly beneficial. Uh, everybody that plays on our current team, the seven that are playing, has had a bigger role, more pressure on them to perform, baptism by fire. Like an example of, think about the end of that game, some of the things that just are head scratchers. The fact that we've gone through that will only prepare those players that were in the game to do it better. Uh, when I talk about finishing the game, sometimes these guys look at me like I'm crazy. Uh, you're up nine points, like, coach, we're going to win. Well, you always have what happened to us at Texas A&M in the forefront of your mind as the coach. But as a player, you don't because you haven't been through that. So all of these experiences, I think, will make us deeper, more versatile, more resilient. And you know, obviously, we need some good fortune to stay away from injuries. And hopefully we can welcome our whole team back um, at some point. You know, you, you feel like uh, that you deserve that. Kadeem Allen deserves that. It would be nice to walk out there and not have to.
you know, come to you guys at the end of the game and talk about surviving foul trouble and some of the things that we currently have to do uh, in our situation. But, you know, moving to tomorrow, I think New Mexico is the best team that we've played this year at home. I would put them in a category with a lot of the other top flight programs that we have. Uh, they have uh, Williams and Brown, an inside-outside combination that I think is about as, as good as that inside-out combination of any team we've played. Uh, they're deep. They play nine or ten every game. They have five front court players and five guards. And, uh, you know, they play in an excellent, excellent conference. Um, they may have had their ups and downs in non-conference play, but every team hits their stride. And you know what? I'm sure this is a game that they would love to hit their stride in right before Christmas, you know, leading into the beginning of the new year. So uh, we have to be ready and focused. I hope we have a supercharged crowd. You know, I remember in the past, this game here before the holidays has a great spirit about it with so many people coming back to Tucson for the holidays. We're, we're really going to need that tomorrow to uh, be at our best. What do, you, what do you like about just renewing the series after Arizona and New Mexico haven't played in so long? Well, I think it makes sense. You know, first of all, you know, you have to take care of, of A, your, your side of the United States, the West Coast. Uh, not playing Gonzaga doesn't make a lot of sense to me because Gonzaga is one of the elite programs in the game and they're located on this side of the country. It makes a lot of sense for our program to play them. You get better. Uh, it's a tremendous game. If you ever win the game, it's a tremendous win. If you lose it, it's, it's a great loss if there is such a thing and it prepares you for the rest of your schedule. And then, you know, the region, we've played at New Mexico State. We've played at UTEP. We've played at UNLV. Uh, we've welcomed Grand Canyon by playing them. We've played NAU virtually every year. I think there's a responsibility that you want to, you know, play those universities and basketball programs that are in the, you know, Southwest. And I think, you know, obviously New Mexico is, is a program that speaks for itself. And I know they have a tremendous home court. So to renew it isn't, you know, again, it's not necessarily a favor to them, just like it wasn't a favor to Grand Canyon. It's in our teams and programs best interest to play them. You know, the travel that's involved, the cost for both teams makes a lot of sense. So um, I think it's something that we've had our eye on for some time. You know, one of the reasons that it's taken some time to, to get this game with them is that we had San Diego State and, and UNLV on the schedule for a number of years. So you, you don't want to play too many teams from the same conference. So that, that's why it took some time. But um, I think it's going to be a, a great two-game series. And hopefully, we'll be uh, ready here tomorrow night. Do you have any, I mean, in this day and age, still with what you're saying, sometimes a high major team wouldn't want to go to Albuquerque like you're going to next year. You might do a two for one or something. But did you have any? Hesitation about doing one for one? No, I mean, New Mexico is a high major program. You know, there's those high major programs that they're checking in at an RPI 200 or 300, or, you know, they, they may have the name of the conference on, on their warm ups, but they're not a quality team. Uh, you know, New Mexico is a quality team, they're a quality program. Just if you look at the last five years of, of who they are, they represent high major basketball. Uh, they're well coached. Uh, they do things the right way. You guys know better than me. They have one of the most phenomenal home courts in the country. They draw. They have a passionate fan base. Uh, they're a perennial postseason team. Uh, they play high majors in the non-conference. They compete for their regular season championship, right? They have players on their in their roster who leave and become NBA players. So I think you have to judge it. College basketball isn't college football. I came from Xavier. Uh, you, are you telling me that Xavier is not a high major program? Gonzaga, Dayton, you know. So Wichita State, you know, playing them last year, they were as good of a team as we played in several years last year. Um, so I think you have to judge the team by truly how they're doing, not, you know, the name or what, what once was. College basketball has really, really changed over the last decade. And scheduling has as well. You know, I would love to have even more home and away series. Uh, we're not shying away from that. But you guys, the only thing you have to do is look and just say this weekend, where did Kentucky and North Carolina play? Where did, where did UCLA and Ohio State play? 
they're just that that's the the culture of college basketball so this year we played more non-conference games in the neutral venue than maybe we would have liked but that allowed our schedule to be i think really good if you look at our schedule teams we played the balance uh, especially adding new mexico to the schedule I'm, I'm really happy with uh, the way we scheduled. I just wish for our fan base that we would have had maybe one or two more here at home. You know, I, I would love the fact if we didn't have a 9 p.m. start or maybe a couple more weekend home games, but that's how it fell this year. Next year, I think it returns back to maybe a little bit more how it used to be. But even next year, it's, it's not easy to establish these home and away series because the, the marquee programs are playing more neutral now than ever before. I watched Davidson in Kansas. You know, they weren't playing in, in uh, Lawrence, Kansas. They're playing in Kansas City. Are, are you, go ahead, Bruce. Long. Well, just to follow up on the New Mexico, I was wondering, uh, you know, of all these regional series you've played, UTEP, uh, like you said, Vegas, Texas Tech one, uh, does this feel different, or do you get the feeling from boosters or longtime fans maybe it's a little bit different? It used to be, years ago, a big-time rival, right? It's, yeah, no, I, I think we're well aware that I'm sure New Mexico is really excited about the opportunity to play us, but... I'm, I'm just telling you, like, we're really excited about the opportunity to play them, too. This isn't a one-way street. We're not the high and mighty, and they're the little guys trying to climb the hill. Uh, they have stature in their program. Uh, they're good. We know they're good. That's, that, again, that's why we scheduled them. We didn't schedule them to renew something that once was. We scheduled them because it makes a lot of sense for our current team and program. And you know, and I, I don't think I can give New Mexico more respect than what I just said. Uh, and, and that is we're playing them because we really uh, think they're a good program. They have a really good coach. They have a good team. And uh, it's going to be a battle. Along those lines, where I was going to go with it is, are you kind of aware of the history, the long or short of it, uh, back when Luke did it? And, yeah. Uh, just any thoughts on, on some of those crazy games? Because they were very crazy at points. No, and uh, it sounds like they were very emotional supercharged and uh but that's really what's fun about college basketball and when you play one of those games in non-conference it prepares you for what's to come because the 18 games in a pac 12 season nine on the road you know they're not easy and uh you know you're challenged night in and night out so i think the experiences that you get in the non-conference will either not prepare you for the pac 12 or will prepare you but when i think of our schedule uh even Grand Canyon, for example, we learned a lot by playing that game. Uh, they were as physical and tough-minded of a team as we had played. You could sense it was a big game for them. And um, our, we got better. We improved as a team because we played them. The Texas A&M game, confidence, the end of the game, the way it finished, playing against somebody like a Tyler Davis, uh, it's going to prepare us for a lot of things here after Christmas for sure. You know, Elijah, we know him well because he played at Modern Day High School, and I remember watching Stanley practice at Modern Day and, and seeing him there. And uh, I know he started his career at Butler, and, and you know, he's an all-conference player, uh, very, very good guard. They run some great offense to get him shots. And uh, he gets to the foul line, and uh, he's a load. He's a really good player. He's, he'll be one of the best perimeter players that we have faced and uh, I would say the same thing for Williams inside. Um, he can really score, rebound, very efficient. And again, their, their coach, um, you know, Craig Neal, he does a great job of getting both of those guys shots. So we have to be able to defend him inside. I hope that what we went through at Texas A&M will prepare our big guys for this challenge because he's very good as well. Do you find in, in general, um, freshmen come to college with higher basketball IQs than they once did? No. I think that freshmen come to college basketball with more unrealistic un expectations than ever before. That, uh, that statement is the most obvious that a college basketball coach can make. That nobody truly understands the process that's going to be required to achieve what they want to achieve. The one and done model is completely upside down in, in any area of civilization. 
Like you don't become a lawyer and go to law school for a year. You become a lawyer, first of all, you have to do an incredible job as an undergraduate student to even get into a law school. And then you have to take the test to further establish that you're qualified. And then you have to get all the way through it. And then when you, when you get to be a lawyer, you don't own your own firm. Like you're, you're the low man on the totem pole, right? And then 15 or 20 years, you're like, look what I've established. And now you're prepared and you have experience and you know that process is well-defined. Do you want me to keep going? I mean, a doctor, a college professor, you don't leave college as an undergraduate student and say, I'm, I'm all set here. I'm going to be one of the best teachers at the University of Arizona. So why in God's name would anybody think that taking a 17 or 18-year-old kid, and most of the time what nobody understands except the college world, their thought process on becoming an NBA player starts in 10th grade. It's not about college. And then when you're in college, if the bump in the road happens, it is a true test of humanity. Are you going to blame the coach? Are you going to blame? Who are you going to blame? And then if you're not going to blame someone, are you going to stick to it and understand that, man, you're doing great, and it's just a matter of time, and you're finally going to get there? We're, ha we're very fortunate this year that we have three freshmen who are very, very good players. And you know what? In each of their cases, they all have things that they really need to improve on. They all have things that they bring to the table initially that you can, you can stamp them as really talented. You know, Raleigh, physically. I mean, it's hard to believe he's only 18. You know, Lowry, skill-wise. Uh, it's hard to believe somebody that size can shoot the basketball the way he can. You know, Kobe, his incredible athleticism. Um, and, and now in each of their cases, they're, they're working hard to add to what they already established. But um, it's just, I mean, it's just really a hard it's really a hard dynamic in college sports. It's very, very difficult uh, in college basketball. Um, I don't think it's good for anything, but that's the way of the world. And you know what? We're gonna we're gonna do the best that we can. Um, but no, incoming freshmen are, are no more prepared than they were 20 years ago. It's just the process is completely upside down. Yeah, so not. No, go ahead. You, you use the word IQ, but talent wise, it's, they're likely better than in the past, or is that covered in your, what you just said? No. If, if Sean Elliott was Sean Elliott as a freshman, you guys would never have gotten to know who he became. He was going to leave by today's standards in, in his one or two years, you know? Um, and. The greatness of Arizona, just like the other programs that we're compared to, a lot of those teams and a lot of those players that you just marvel at and just you have such great feelings about. I'll use Damon Stoudemire as an example who was with us as a coach. I mean, how good was Damon Stoudemire at Christmas of his freshman year? I mean, he, he was just kind of a little guy on the team. And there's a lot of people that when I talk to, and uh, that would tell me that Damon Stoudemire arguably is, is the greatest guard to ever play at Arizona, statistically, and who he was at the end. I mean, his NBA career speaks to that. Um, if you judged Jason Terry as a Christmas of his freshman year, if he was disgruntled about his opportunity to play and he left Arizona in the spring of his freshman year, you know, think about how different that is. Well. That's the culture, not at Arizona right now, but in college basketball. And, uh, you know, I, I see Malik Monk score 47 points as a freshman, and, and it's just incredible how, how talented that he is. But to think that there would have been a Malik Monk a decade or 15 years ago that would have been Kentucky's seventh or eighth man. Uh, it's just a different game right now. And uh, I, I don't. I don't see, you know, I, I guess for, for those guys who are really, really talented, they're upside in making money because they leave and they're in the NBA for a longer period of time. You can make the case that that's great for them, but they're the 1%. The other 99%, I just, it's a hard, it's a hard situation. So 
Are you more frustrated because now it looks like they're going to continue that? <coughs> no, I'm not even frustrated. I'm, 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 it is what it is. I mean, we're recruiting five players a year. You guys know that. Um, you know, we take inventory every day. We're playing. We, I mean, we're led by three freshmen in scoring. I mean, we've, we've embraced it. If, if somebody wants to be one and done, we're going to do whatever we can to help them get there. I try to be honest. Uh, we've had players that talk about that, and if, if you see that that's not the case, you have to step forward and say that's not the case. And sometimes maybe they don't come to Arizona. But um, the other thing that's tricky is, you know, every once in a while somebody surprises you. Uh, if you could have predicted Derek Williams, you know, would have been the number two pick in the draft after his second year, there would have been a lot of takers on that bet when he left high school. You know, sometimes it happens uh, unexpectedly that way. I was just curious, sure, with the guys being scattered, uh, is anybody, uh, not many guys going to get back for Christmas, or what's the plan? No, uh, we're just, we're going to, uh, after the game tomorrow, there'll be some that will be able to leave the next morning. Uh, most of our other guys will. Uh, if they can't, go home to their actual family. They'll be with friends and their family. I think Lowry's fortunate his, his mom is, is visiting him for the first time. So he'll be with family here in the United States. He won't have to go all the way back to Finland. Um, but every, everybody on our team will get a Christmas break. I think we get back sometime on Christmas Day. And uh, I hate to do that, but we're also leaving, I think, a day earlier than we otherwise do. But we usually take three or four days off, and we'll, we will have those three or four days off this year. Do you know who's staying then? I assume Dusan, like Rob, would Raleigh go back to Brooklyn? Or I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing about um, Christmas break is the families of all of our players know the date that, that they're going to leave to go home as far back as a year earlier. So they're able to make accommodations and arrangements to make sure that the flight, or if they need a flight, and do the things that they need to do in a, in a timely, costly manner. To see your son can play on Friday night, and obviously it's very similar to the Rich Rod situation. Two coaches' sons, seniors, trying to make their mark. And I was just curious. You know, Rich talked a lot this season about his interaction with Rhett in the round of the game and, and watching tape. And is that similar with you and in, in Cam? Do you guys is there is there a deep basketball connection in that way? Where um, yes and no. You know, I'm, I I probably err on the side too much of 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 sometimes just being supportive and being his dad. Um, certainly want him to do well, both in school and uh, on the court. And you know, when your kids have goals and dreams, you, you want to help them realize those goals and dreams. But uh, one of the things that's hard as a college basketball coach is, I mean, you just you're gone so much that in my best attempt to be really connected, uh, for example, we played a game on Friday. We we were in Houston. You know, you're a lot of times. Uh, there's, there's a distance there whether you want it to be or not. And same thing in the summer. Uh, when he's on the circuit in the spring or summer, um, you know, I'm on a, a, a different circuit a lot of times. So uh, my wife deserves a lot of credit. She's the one who's with him every game, every day. And uh, for me, I, I try to be as supportive as I possibly can. I mean, do we talk basketball? Of course. Uh, but I'd say about 10% about how much that my dad would have talked to me, you know, as a high school coach, somebody who would have been around me every day. Uh, maybe less than 10%, actually. <laughs> oh. Your wife must be pretty good at <laughs> school. She thinks she is, no question. And, 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 uh, but, you know, my, my, kid, my uh, sons are fortunate. They've played for really good high school coaches and, and enjoy the high school program, and it's fun watching them play and compete. Only because when we first moved to Tucson, um, we, you know, we had a late start. So, you know, we chose the school that was the closest to our home. And uh, that worked for uh, Austin, our oldest son. And then, you know, Cameron and Braden, they, they're both at South Point. So, uh, but both schools were great. Thanks,